Hi, welcome to The Reason live stream. I'm Zach Weissmuller, and today we're going to be talking about the recent collapse of the Silicon Valley Bank, uh, of Silicon Valley Bank and the subsequent interventions from the FDIC, um, also a couple uh, uh, you know other bank failures that are that are relevant we'll we'll be talking about and I'm joined by two very knowledgeable guests who help walk me through uh, and walk us through what exactly happened. Um, first, we've got Arnold Kling, uh, an economist, uh, a senior scholar with the Mercatus Center. He worked uh, in the Federal Reserve System. And for Freddie Mac, uh, he writes uh, a, a great blog called uh, In My Tribe, a Substack that I am a subscriber to. Um, welcome, Arnold, to The Reason live stream. Good to see you. Hi, Hi Zach. And I'm also joined today by Lynn Alden, of Lynn, founder of Lynn Alden Investment Strategies um, and author of the Strategic Investment Newsletter, which is a free um, investment advice newsletter. Lynn, thank you for joining us as well. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. So to start the conversation, um, you know, there's a few competing explanations out there of what exactly happened here with Silicon Valley Bank in particular. Um, you know, who's to blame? Why did it happen? And I think the best place to start is just the basic question of, you know, what happened? I, I think most people understand the concept of a bank run. People get nervous, want to take their money out. The money's not literally there in the vault. But what is the reason that there was a bank run, Arnold, in, in, you know, if you had to boil it down, what happened to Silicon Valley Bank? Okay, so the story, I think, goes like this. This is, you know, I've not been in the bank. I'm not a bank examiner. I'm not a bank auditor. I only know what I read in the papers. So what I read is uh, their deposits shot up between 20, early 2020 and early 2022. Uh, <laughs> Silicon, they, their customers were uh, Silicon Valley startups. Startups were just getting flooded with money. They hadn't spent it yet. They deposited it with the bank and then they would use it over time to make payroll and what have you. Uh, then, <laughs> and so what, what do you do with all that money? Well, they, they said that we'll be sort of conservative with it. We're going to invest it in treasury securities, but short-term treasury securities hardly pay anything. Long-term treasury securities pay, let's say, between one and a half and two percent. So we'll, we'll we'll go for that. Um, then 2022 comes along. We get inflation is inflation fighting is the new thing at the Fed, and long-term rates are no longer at two percent. They're more like four percent. What that does to the value of, of a 2% bond when rates are 4% is it roughly cuts it in half. So their bonds weren't worth much uh, or worth, weren't as, worth as much as when they bought them. Then, as I understand it, the, uh, as the Silicon Valley tech boom falters, the deposits start to dwindle. And now the bank has to do something to deal with the deposit outflow. How's it going to pay its customers? So it ha if it sells the bonds, it has to sell them at a loss. If it sells them at a loss, it kind of looks bad. Uh, so it's so pretty reluctant to do it, but I think they ended up having to do it. Um, and then the old story of... Uh, you know, I went bankrupt uh, in two ways, slowly, then suddenly. And the suddenly happened uh, <laughs> a few weeks ago. The depositors, these tech firms that had deposits, were in the position of having very, very large bank deposits. And the federal, the insurance limit up until last week was two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a deposit, and they might have you know two million in deposits. So now they think they could lose <laughs> quite a bit if there's something wrong with the bank. They're hearing that there's something wrong with the bank. So what do you do? You go and you say, I'm going to take my excess out of the bank and put it somewhere else where it'll be safer. Uh, 
and enough people do that and like you know, to the tune of like 40 billion dollars and the and the bank is just in no position to meet that is that yeah no th th thank you for that and uh, I'll, i just want to invite lynn to uh you know add anything uh to that explanation that uh, you think is relevant um i did you know there's this this chart here that shows um the uh, this is kind of the, the banking system as a whole to, to the point that that Arnold was uh, raising there about this, you know, the bank buying up a lot of bonds that then became less valuable. You see the, um, the amount of cash and treasuries as a total percentage of bank assets across all commercial banks. And um, you see a, a spike there. But let me uh, just invite Lynn to you know, modify, add, or, you know, fully agree with that explanation? Well, I think it was a great explanation. Um, a, a couple of details I think I could add is that, um, you know, bank deposits across the country went up pretty significantly in 2020 and 2021 because of the stimulus. We had a you know, big increase in the money supply. Uh, but some banks got more deposits than others because they were more in like a hot area. So, for example, Silicon Valley Bank had a bigger rise in its deposits than the typical bank because tech startups were a very big, you know, uh, thing in, in that period. And they did invest in those long duration assets. So what makes it, you know, with that, that chart you just pulled up, that shows how yeah. it's very different than 2008, because 2008, the problem was that so many banks made bad loans uh, and they had very little exposure to cash and treasuries, which are considered some of their safer assets. Uh, and they instead were heavily involved in, in subprime mortgage and a lot of those defaulted. This time it shows that the, it, in some ways it's the opposite problem. They hold very, very safe assets. Uh, it's just that the prices of those assets um, went against them. And in Silicon Valley's case, they made a very big bet on duration. So banks had to invest their deposits, their new deposits somewhere. And there's some banks like JP Morgan that were conservative and they mostly kept in short duration types of assets, whereas Silicon Valley Bank made a very big bet on those longer duration assets. And so if you, if you look at banks across the board, Silicon Valley Bank had unrealized losses on their, on their securities that, that you know, roughly equaled their total capital. Meaning that if they if they had to have a bank run and have to sell those assets for a loss, uh, you know, depositors might not get every every dollar back. And you know, the thing is, if they can hold those assets to maturity, um, you know, some of them are are can't default. Other ones have a very very low default risk. But if they get their their deposit funding pulled and they have to sell at a loss, then they basically you know that gets marked to market and they have a problem. And the the last point I'll make is that um, you know. Because FDIC insures deposits up to two hundred fifty thousand, you know, a, a typical bank that just has a lot of retail deposits, that's a pretty solid deposit base because people are not going to freak out too much if they if they think their bank has a problem. Whereas the issue with Silicon Valley Bank is they they had a higher than normal percentage of uninsured deposits, and that's because most of their depositors were businesses. So there are some businesses that would hold even tens of millions of dollars in an account. You know, the average deposit was not that big, but they, you know, they could be half a million, could be a million, could be a million and a half, could be five million. Um, and so if they perceive that combination of high unrealized losses, which Silicon Valley Bank had more of than normal, and they have the combination of mostly uninsured deposits, which, which again, Silicon Valley Bank was a standout, then that's a prime target for a, a bank run because people have a greater incentive to pull out and then it causes a problem. So the, it raises the question of which you've already kind of answered of why was why was so much of their money in these bonds um, and one uh, person who's been very vocal about this uh, I just pulled up his tweet is Balaji Srinivasan um, uh, who we've had on the show before and um, he says. He, he points the finger directly at the Fed for causing this problem. He says, hey, remember when Powell said that he wouldn't raise rates in April, June, July, and October 2021, and people trusted him and the Fed and bought bonds with billions in customer deposits because of those assurances? Well, they got wrecked, and that's how the Fed caused this crisis. And he points to this concept of forward guidance where the, you know, the Fed sends out these signals of what they're going to do. Um, the part I have highlighted here says, when central banks provide forward guidance, individuals and businesses will use this information in making decisions about spending and investments. Um, what is your, what, what do you think about uh, Arnold, uh, what Balaji's, uh, the argument that he's making there? 
Um, I don't think that's the most interesting or useful case to make against the Fed. Um, so let me back up a little bit. We've been talking about government bonds as risk-free, but there are two dimensions of risk. There's, uh, you know, and, and, you know the, and Lynn mentioned both of them. One of them is credit risk, which is, means it's a default. And let's assume that there's no credit risk from, um, from government bonds. That, that's, that's, it's t that's your standard assumption. I won't mm -hmm. depart from it. But there is this duration risk or interest rate risk. As If, if you buy a long-term government bond and rates go up, the value of your bond declines. So um, you're, taking, you're taking interest rate risk regardless of what Powell says. I mean, anyone who says that, you know, Powell can keep interest rates low forever for as long as he wants uh, doesn't understand finance. And so I, I'm not going to excuse anybody. No, no one, you know, if someone came to court, you know, and said, you know, I plead innocent. I listened to Powell. You know, no one's going to, I wouldn't accept that. No, no one in finance would accept that. But let's back up a little bit. Um, I mean, gosh, there's so much financial history we could discuss. I mean, I, I think in a, a lot of ways, this is a complete rerun of the savings and loan crisis of the 1980s. And a lot of my perspective comes from that, being an, being old enough to have been a, a kind of uh, an active observer of that. Um, I don't want to go back that far right now. Let's just go back to 2008. So the government decides to run big deficits and the Federal Reserve decides to do this thing called quantitative easing, which, and what quantitative easing consists of is the Fed doing what SVB did. I want you to hear that. The Fed is, starts issuing short-term liabilities uh, called paying interest on reserves, and it buys long-term assets, including mortgage-backed securities and long-term government bonds. At the time, that was we were told that was a temporary thing to deal with the recession that followed the financial crisis. It never stopped. And then in 2020, the pandemic hits. The government blows out even bigger deficits, and we have even more, quote, quantitative easing. And they come up with even a new tactic called reverse repo. I won't explain how that works, but it's another way where the Fed is borrowing short and lending long. As we speak, the Fed is the most bankrupt bank in the country. You know, they're, they're not going to collapse. They can always take more money from the Treasury, but that is just, that's just the reality. They, they are in the position of SVB in terms of you know the market value of their portfolio um so i think you know when you go so you know i think the process by which svp went down is as i described it when you talk about blame then you have to talk about who could have done differently and you know a lot of people would say i, I think this is really strange but a lot of people would say that the uh venture-backed um, firms should have behaved differently. They'll say, well, they shouldn't have put, you know, five million dollars in deposit at this one bank. They should have spread their deposits around. They shouldn't have put the money in. And I've also heard the op sort of the opposite, which is they shouldn't have all taken their money out uh, a couple weeks ago. They should have left it in. So they sh shouldn't have put as much in when they thought the bank was solvent, and they shouldn't have taken as much out when they thought the bank was in trouble. So that's, you know, okay, it, it's tr probably true that if they hadn't done those things, we wouldn't have had this bank run, but that kind of blame, I don't fit. The blame that I think I'm inclined to do is to go all the way back to that deficit spending and the quantitative easing. Uh, there you're really putting the whole country at risk. There's no, you know, it did, it does not end well. It, it leads to the inflation. The inflation leads to the high interest rates. The high interest rates bankrupt a bunch of companies, including a huge portion of the banking system. 
I think there's something like still $600 billion of embedded losses in, the, in all the banks and only about $2 trillion in equity. So they've lost about a third of their equity. Um, so all that I trace back to the loose deficit spending and the quantitative easing. Lynn, I'm interested in this concept of the, that Arnold mentioned in that answer of the Fed being broke and that having, uh, you know, that con having a contributory effect here. And and you, in one of your recent newsletters, wrote about that exact issue um, and and claimed that that the Fed is broke. Uh, you, you had embedded this chart here um, showing basic. Well. I'll let you uh, explain, you know, what this is, but it's showing in my understanding that the money going from the, the there is no money now flowing from the Federal Reserve uh, in into the Treasury. So could you give us an explanation of what the situation with the Fed is right now and, and how it's different from, you know, uh, uh, you know, anything in our our memory of of what's been going on with the Fed? Sure. The Federal Reserve, uh, you know, as Arnold pointed out, does have a similar problem to a lot of these banks, with the key difference being that they can't do a bank run on the central bank. Um, and so basically it's it's in a position where, you know, they raise their liability side uh, interest rates much higher uh, compared to their asset side, which are longer duration fixed rate assets. And so, you know, for, for most of the Fed history, you know, their liabilities are things like bank notes, which don't pay any interest, bank reserves, um, and reverse repos. And then their asset side is mostly treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. And those are longer duration assets. And so for most of Fed history for decades, um, you know, their assets pay a higher uh, average interest rate than their liabilities. And so they, they, they make a profit, they cover their expenses, and then they send the remaining to the treasury as a remittance. Um, whereas what we've seen since September of last year was that because they raised their interest rate side so quickly, uh, now their liabilities are paying a higher interest rate than their assets. It's actually worse than most banks because most banks, you know, if you look at their deposit rates, they're nowhere near um, as high as current interest rates, um, whereas the Feds are. So actually the Fed is operating at a loss and it has something like a trillion dollars in, in unrealized losses, uh, with a key difference being that, you know, you know, th those like that liability side can't go anywhere. It can't get rapidly pulled down. Uh, the, the main kind of downside from that is that the treasury is no longer getting their remittances anymore. And even if the Fed would become profitable in the future, they still get to pay themselves back uh, before they would resume those remittances. So it's basically contributing to the, the fiscal budget deficit. And if we go back to the prior question of, you know, who's to blame here, you know, a lot of, you see a lot of people say just blaming the Fed or just blaming that bank. And it's, it's just kind of a mix of a lot of factors because the Federal Reserve did create a very difficult operating environment when you have, say, a rapid increase in the amount of broad money supply, uh, very low interest rates. And, you know, when asked about the uh, rapid increase in the broad money supply, the, the Federal Reserve chairman said he didn't really see this being inflationary. Um, then, of course, it was inflationary. And then they, you know, they had, to, they had to pivot their whole monetary policy. They raised rates. They also sucked liquidity back out of the, the banking system. Uh, and so basically banks are undergoing this gigantic whipsaw uh, that is just a difficult operating environment to work through. But then, of course, some banks manage that risk better than others. Uh, so there, there are banks that manage their duration risk uh, very well, uh, and they also choose their depositors. I mean, it, it's a choice for Silicon Valley Bank to go after those big business depositors that are, that are more of a flight risk. Mm -hmm. um, and it was their choice to invest almost exclusively in long duration assets, which have bigger price swings. And so I, it's it's certainly the case that that bank made severe errors of of judgment in terms of risk management, uh, but it's also the case that just a, across the banking sector, it is just a more challenging environment to operate in when you have kind of record swings in interest rates and uh, you know just overall cash in the system. So if the government's uh, federal government's you know s deficit spending policies and and the treasury's money printing and the federal reserve's interventions have created this whipsaw and uh, you know certainly let's at least say uh, poured f fuel on the fire here and and um, you know created a level of uncertainty. You know, the, the argument that you were hearing from a lot of the proponents of uh, of bailing out the depositors above that 250,000 minimum, 
uh, beyond, you know, we can get to, we'll, we'll get to the, you know, systemic issue later, but, you know, one argument that they, that I heard being made was basically the government created this situation. And so it is kind of their responsibility to swoop in and cover those uninsured deposits. Um, do you buy, do either of you buy that particular argument? Well, I think that, you know, from the standpoint of March, they had to do it. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, you, you know, you could, you know, this is one of those situations where if they don't do it, uh, you know, you can, you know, get your apple cart and take it out on the street. And that's how you're going to make your money going forward. I mean, it, it, you're going to have, you could have really drastic consequences. However, what is going to happen going forward is, um, I mean, what you can think of, you can think of any kind of deposit insurance or government guarantee as a subsidy from the government to the banks. Subsidies don't come free. The tax that pays for the subsidy is going to be re regulation, and and there has to be the the. These banks are what I call zombie banks. That is, they have negative net worth. The only way that uh, executives and shareholders can come out, out of it really well is if they go out and take big gambles and they pay off. And if those gambles don't pay off, it'll be on us, the taxpayers, to pay for it. So that has to be regulated. They're going to be put in a straitjacket. So we are going to have, you know, we don't see it immediately, but we're going to have over the next few months, the next several years, a much more regulated banking system. Uh, I think somebody I read somewhere, uh, I guess this was Robert Altman, a former Treasury Secretary, saying we've, we've, we've basically nationalized the banks. And that's one way to think about it. We, the, the, the private sector financial se the the private part of the financial sector has just shrunk dramatically, and the regulated part of the financial sector has just gone up dramatically. And we'll just we'll see that over the next several months and years. To follow up on that, could you explain a little bit more what you mean by the phrase "zombie banks"? Uh, it's just a bank where, if you marked all of its assets and liabilities. To market, or if you just said, "All right, today you just have to sell all your assets and pay off your depositors," you know, liquidate the bank. Uh, if you tried to liquidate the bank, you would not end up uh, with any any equi anything left for the shareholders and executives. So this, and I call it as it's called a zombie. It's not really my term. It goes back to the savings and loan crisis, when the savings and loans were given the opportunity to keep going even though that they were they were insolvent they went nuts they bought junk bonds they bought commercial real estate and as uh, one economist pointed out what 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 the zombie banks would savings and loans would do is they would pay higher interest rates because they were so desperate to kind of you know keep gambling and they would buy weaker uh, invest in weaker loans. And what does that do to a, a healthy bank or savings and loan? Well, now you know, their ability to compete has gone away. So these zombies are really dangerous. And that's why uh, there will be ju justifiably very tight regulations. Another um, you know, vi another villain that's been blamed, I guess, uh, and this is coming from the highest uh, echelons of government, including uh, Biden himself, is the concept uh, or is deregulation, basically, that back during the Trump era, uh, the 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 assets mix that the big banks had to hold did not apply to the smaller and mid-sized banks. And we're going to just play a clip of Biden here in a second um, talking about uh, the role that he thinks that played. And I'd like to get uh, both of your response to the idea that um, deregulation um, weakening Dodd-Frank is what led to this problem. Um, Adam, could you play that clip? During the Obama-Biden administration, we put in place tough requirements on banks 
like Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, including the Dodd-Frank law to make sure that the crisis we saw in 2008 would not happen again. Unfortunately, the last administration rolled back some of these requirements. I'm going to ask Congress and the banking regulators to strengthen the rules for banks to make it less likely this kind of bank failure would happen again. Uh, Lynn, do you have any thoughts as to whether, because that, that goes to the question of, you know, the types of assets that the banks are holding to make them more resilient against bank runs. Do you think uh, Biden has a point there? But I think one of the issues is that the types of assets that caused this, this, this particular banking problem were not the same types of assets that caused the 2008 crisis for the most part. Those were more credit problems. These are more duration problems. And so some of the regu- a lot of the regulations put in place during that time were more meant for that, that prior type of problem. And it's also worth pointing out that, you know, the, you mentioned the Dodd-Frank uh, bill. Uh, Frank was on the board of directors of, of Signature Bank. Uh, mm-hmm. which which is one of the ones that was taken down. And so, it, and a lot of it shows that it, it's kind of a different set of problems they're dealing with. I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's still the same thing of trying to keep your assets higher than your liabilities. Uh, but there's different ways that your assets or liabilities can fall, uh, you know, can change. And so uh, some of the regulations were basically not the same types of regulations that would have prevented this. Um, I, I think basically this this would have been mitigated by, say, if they were if, if banks are either required to or just on their own, you know, if they want to manage risk better, just not take as much duration of risk in addition to not taking as much credit risk. So a lot of the prior regulations were focused around limiting how much credit risk uh, banks can take. And uh, yeah, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that too, uh, Arnold, because, you know, it kind of goes to your your previous answer that, you, you know, you're saying that we're we're kind of barreling towards de facto nas- nationalization because there's just no tolerance for any kind of risk in, in the banking sector. Um, so is that, uh, is it plausible to say, you know, is, is Biden's argument that, you know, weakening Do- Dodd-Frank uh, is, is, a, is a plausible mechanism? Um, and what, what do you expect to see as the, the regulations um, to, you know, further decrease risk uh, in small and mid-sized banks, what effect is that going to have? Okay. Well, the going back to his argument, what is true is that banks that are have over, over um, well, under Dodd-Frank, banks that had over $50 billion in assets were regulated differently than banks that had under $50 billion. And he he mentions Trump and everyone mentions Trump, but actually it was a bipartisan decision in Congress because Congress was bribed, you know, you know, both parties were bribed uh, to exempt to raise that from 50 billion to 250 billion. Mm -hmm. Having said that, we don't know whether regulating them differently would have produced a different result. That's what no one has filled in. And mm-hmm. I don't see any reason why that's true. There was nothing, nothing to stop regulators from coming in and getting Silicon Valley Bank to change its behavior. In fact, the, the rapid growth of Silicon Valley Bank was the reddest red flag a regulator could ever see. So there was just, and and they could see the balance sheet. There was nothing stopping them. You can't just wave your hands and say deregulation. There was deregulation. They had the power, the knowledge. They could have done it. Conversely, if it had been in the $250 billion category, the regulators could have let them go. I mean, Mm -hmm. if they let them go as they stood, they could have let them go at $250 billion. There's just, so... That's what's demagogic about blaming deregulation. There, there was enough discretion either above the $250 billion level or below it to make whatever, make whatever decision they wanted, and they, ma- they didn't make the best decision. I'm also curious to, to know what you think the effects of, because it, now it's unclear that you know, with, with the FDIC stepping in, to cover all the deposits, it's it's unclear. Like, you know, if other banks go down, 
what is the what is the limit there? Um, and it and all of this raises questions about what we call moral hazard, and that's a question that um, uh, Larry Summers, the former Treasury Secretary, former President Harvard, um, said is not something to worry about. Uh, at, at this, or you know, he said in the lead up to the bailout of the depositors that it's not really a question that uh, can be front of mind for regulators. We're, we're going to just play that clip real quick, and then I'd like to get your both of your reactions to the moral hazard problem that this kind of intervention, you know, might uh, might raise uh, going forward. I don't think this is a time for moral hazard lectures or for talk about teaching people uh, lessons. We have enough strains and challenges uh, in the economy without adding the collateral consequences of uh, a breakdown in an important sector. What's your reaction, Arnold? If not hundreds well, I, I, I agree with him. Uh, you know, Larry's my age. He remembers the savings and loan crisis, and he knows what moral hazard is. But he also knows that, you know, this is this is an emergency. Mm. That if you if you let the uh, if you stick with the two hundred fifty thousand dollar ceiling, obviously a lot of tech firms get wiped out, and you know. I don't feel like they deserved it, and I don't think it. I think it would have been horrible for all of the the people who worked for them. It you know, caused caused all sorts of chaos. Uh, and on top of that, you have all these other banks where you know everyone can you know can look at their financial statements and see that you know a certain percentage of them are underwater, not as badly as SVB, but they are underwater. And so you'll have bank runs all over the place, total chaos in the financial system. So yeah, to worry, you worry about moral hazard tomorrow, not today. I don't think Larry would say you never worry about moral hazard. And I think he knows you're creating a ton of moral hazard. And my point about zombie banks is that they are the ones who, the owners there are the ones who have lots of moral hazard, especially now that all their deposits are guaranteed. If they're underwater, they have nothing to lose by taking money to Las Vegas and betting, and they have everything to gain. And the only thing that stops them from doing that is regulation. And that means that the regulation is going to be tighter. And I think that that is going to last forever. There's this basic trend that government financial policy, whether it's monetary policy, whether it's regulatory policy, it all the policies that survive are the policies that allow government to allocate credit to its preferred uses, especially to its own spending. And that's where we're, we're going to see another ratchet of that. We saw a ratchet in 2008, where prior to 2008, the government did a lot to support housing, maybe too much. I, I, I could argue that it's too much. But after 2008, it basically took the money that would have gone into housing and, and used it to finance its own deficits. And that's, you know, that's the trend that's going to be exacerbated as we ratchet up government's control over the banking system. Lynn, do you agree that that's going to ultimately be the effect of this? And how, if so, uh, how do we, do you have any ideas about how to escape that or, or how the, you know, the banking, are, are there any ways around that? Or is this kind of just an inevitable process that, uh, we've got to learn to live with. If you look back in the 1940s, which was the last time that federal debt to GDP was as high as it is now, banks did become basically these vehicles where just a lot of government debt was was monetized in there. And that's, it's unfortunately kind of common to happen in countries that have this level of deficit and debt spending, where the banks essentially become like utilities uh, in that regard. We've also seen it's a multi-decade trend of bank consolidation, uh, you know, it, it used to be like tens of thousands of banks. Now there's like 4,000 banks. The top 10 banks have like half of all assets. Uh, right now there's a depositor flight from small banks to big banks. So that's a, it's a continuing trend. Um, you know, as far as more hazard goes, I mean, at least the, um, 
shareholders were not bailed out, right? So there was no, you know, there's still risk from investing in a poorly managed bank. Um, mm-hmm. You know, as far as depositors go, th- most indicators show that they would have gotten like 80 cents back on their dollar um, if that were allowed to, to play out. Um, you know, there's, it's not, I don't think it's a moral case that those depositors had to be bailed out, but I, from their perspective of preventing future bank runs in an emergency, I can see why they wanted to do it. Yeah. But like, you know, most moral hazard decisions are, are kind of that trend of fix the problem now uh, and then address the moral hazard later. And they never really address the moral hazard um, either because they just don't or because it's, it's you know, they've kind of created a, a situation that we can't really address it. Um, and so I, I, you know, I think that's a, just a general trend that just keeps happening. Yeah. So do you uh, think that, you know, aside from the, you know, the moral hazard question, do you think that it was necessary? Do you think, uh, it, is it your opinion that this was a real systemic risk and uh, everything, you know, that we would have just seen kind of a cascade of bank runs if the FDIC hadn't intervened in this way? I think you probably would have. I, I think there's different ways that they could have they didn't necessarily have had to backstop the depositors in this bank. Yeah. Uh, they did clearly had to provide some sort of liquidity facility um, because banking system from its very foundations, not really a free market activity to begin with. Um, and you, you'd have a cascade where, you know, a typical bank, a small bank has something like, you know, less than 10% of its deposits in, in liquid cash ready mm-hmm. to go. And so you could get like a really bad liquidity squeeze. So the, clearly they had to provide, some sort of liquidity facility to prevent kind of mass for sales, mass disruptions, things like that, partially based on their own actions that they themselves caused by, you know, contributing to such a, a volatile monetary environment of rapidly increasing, you know, bank reserves and then contracting bank reserves and rapidly increasing and in, in falling interest rates and all that. Um, but they didn't necessarily have to backstop the depositors. That was kind of an extra step I think they took to shore up confidence in, in further banks and prevent large-scale bank runs so it, there's clearly an array of choices they could have made no. um but it, doing nothing wasn't really an option an- another choice i wonder about is you know there's this there's reporting from semaphore here that i'm displaying uh why the biggest banks were first shut out of bidding on silicon valley bank and uh the report says that uh you know the largest u.s banks didn't submit a bid for silicon valley bank over the weekend largely because they were initially excluded from the sales process by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corp and ran out of time as a result. I mean, w- wouldn't that kind of be the natural market solution is that one of the bigger banks would just scoop them up? And what was the reason that what would be the reason for the government to block that sort of acquisition? Well, I guess I, I don't sit in on those meetings, so I don't know. But you, you have to realize there's a negotiation that's going to go on. Uh, the buyer is going to say, all right, I want to be held harmless against certain things. And I want to have certain sweeteners. And the government who's, in the, you know, who's basically taken over the bank as a process of selling it has to negotiate. Um, and... There's actually, so the perception among people on the left is that the, uh, in the 2008 crisis, when, when you know, a lot of banks were merged suddenly, uh, is that the government ne- didn't negotiate hard enough. And the, the perception of Jamie Dimon and some other bankers is that the government didn't negotiate in good faith because uh, you know, he, bu- he buys some bad banks and then years later, uh, those bad banks are fined for behavior that took place before he bought them, and he's he he has to pay up. So I don't know who you know who's right and who's wrong in this particular negotiation, because like I said, I wasn't in the room. The the I, I'm I'm curious to ask uh, Lynn about um, you know the what you think about the future of banking, and um, there, there's you, you've argued. In, in uh, let me pull it up here. Um, there's you've said that ironically, regulators want banks to be reasonably safe, but not too safe, um, and that there's this 
kind of deeper question that nobody's really talking about, which is one way to, to avoid bank runs would actually to just be to hold more cash reserves, but that because of the way that um, the, the Federal Reserve and um, the FDIC and just banking regulation works, it's a lot harder to set up and get a, a char an approved charter if you run a bank that way. One, one example of that is Custodia Bank, which I'm showing here, which I believe holds actually over, uh, it holds like 108% of, of its deposits in cash. So people can always get the bank uh, or always get their money out um, theoretically and they pay, they, they fund this through fees instead of, um, you know, uh, loans. So could you talk a little bit about that, that issue, uh, Lynn of, um, fractional reserve banking? Yeah, there have been a number of attempts over the years for people to try to create full reserve banks, um, where, you know, instead of having just a percentage of deposits, uh, in cash, they would have, uh, you know, at least a hundred percent of deposits in cash. And, and, you know, one of the main examples was the narrow bank, um, you know, these the start as as state chartered banks, and what they what they do is they apply to have access to the Federal Reserve, and the narrow bank basically just you know uh, they wanted to take deposits and then put them on deposit with the Fed as a bank reserve, and therefore from a from a depositor's perspective, you just have like you know you'd be basically banking with the Federal Reserve, except you'd have a thin layer of of administrative overhead between you and the, and the Fed because they'd be operating you know the basic banking services that you need. Um, and their their um, application was kind of held in in stasis for a number of years. Uh, there's been courts, over, you know, court things over that. It's like ironically they're trying to make from a depositor perspective about as safe as a bank you can make, but they they get criticized as, as it contributing to systemic problems because then it could suck deposits out from fractional reserve banks towards that one, uh, at least for certain types of depositors. And then the, the more recent case, just this past year, was Custodia Bank. Um, led by Caitlin Long, and they want to do more than just that. But they're but from the depositor perspective, they do plan they plan on putting 108 percent of deposits uh, at the Fed so that they could withstand 100 percent deposit bank run if it were to occur. They, and they, again, they would do other services on the side, but in terms of that deposit and and what they do with it, uh, and and they were also held for a long time in, in stasis and then ultimately denied. Um, and so, and there's been other attempts like that in other countries too. And in a, in a low interest rate environment, they'd have to charge, you know, they'd have to charge depositors some sort of fee to, for those services. In the current environment, they actually wouldn't have to because banks get paid pretty high interest rates on their reserves. And so they could essentially cover that overhead with those and then even, even potentially pass um, some deposit uh, interest onto depositors. Um, yeah, and it's just it's not something that the Federal Reserve has wanted to exist for a variety of reasons. Do you, is what do you think about that, um, Arnold? Is there a, a sense in which you know there that innovation in banking has been stymied, and that that is contributing to a more fragile environment? Um, like, how how do we break out of this you know hyper fragile regulated? Um, system that we're we seem to be stuck with right now and, and headed more so in that direction. Well, John Cochran, who's an economist at the Hoover Institution, uh, has always been an advocate of what you know Lynn rightly calls narrow banking. And you can think of 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 banks as serving two purposes. One is they operate a payment system, so you know they make sure that uh, that you can pay for things smoothly. I mean, it's sort of, you know, when I was growing up, that meant checking accounts and people writing checks. And, you know, now we've forgotten all about that. We, you know, use our phones or our credit cards or what have you. But ultimately, banks are kind of, you know, doing the payment processing. Um, and what <laughs> what John would like to do is separate out payment processing from what I might call real banking. Uh, so payment processing, you know, you're just, if, if somebody's got a deposit with you, like Lynn said, you have, you put a hundred percent backing of that. So if they walked, if every depositor walked in today and asked for their money, you could give it to them. You know, you just, you know, hundred percent reserves. Um, and he wants that type of bank 
to be required to be in the payment system. So he would actually like every bank to be like Custodia Bank in that sense. Mm. I, I don't know the de all the details about Custodial Bank, but he would like there to be the Fed and then a layer of private banks operating the payment system and depositors. And that's one banking system. And then what I don't know, I'll call this real banking because uh, banks are in the business of uh, putting onto their balance sheets uh, long-term risky assets and short-term riskless liabilities. So that's that kind of mismatch is there. Um, you want some of that banking to take place. I mean, it, it just it helps the economy. But if they do too much, like SVB did, uh, you get you know you get too much of a, a of a of a Minsky cycle of, of people getting too exuberant, the economy doing really well, and then all of a sudden they they don't and they don't take enough risks. So. Um, so that's a, a challenge, uh, getting real banking right in some sense. You do want to subsidize it in some ways. You have to tax it by regulation in some ways. Um, we can talk about what might be the optimal structure to kind of make that happen. But reality is government is not aiming for the optimal structure. Government acts as if it's aiming to get the most credit for the allocated to the channel to the um, its desired uses including its own spending and that's that's the reality that we deal with and that that's i don't know how to fight that because no. uh regardless of what they say they're doing regardless of what we might want them to do that's what they're doing well, so there's one line of argument that I think is worth getting into here because it's uh, it's the Bitcoin solves this line of argument that you have to totally exit uh, the banking system, the banking cartel, because there is no all the incentives are lined up in the way that you just laid out for the government, um, uh, Arnold. What uh, say you to that, Lynn, is, you know, the, the kind of Bitcoin maximalist approach, the only way out of this to, to force the issue? Well, I mean, I think part of the reason fractional reserve banking exists because you've always had the, you know, historically it, it grew over a gold based system because you had that mismatch in speed. Gold was slow. Um, and people needed services on top of their gold, but then that creates a mismatch. Well, you know, once a bank realizes that only a certain percentage of their depositors are likely to ever withdraw at once, they start realizing that they can make a profit by using that liquidity difference to their benefit. And once one bank does that, they create cost pressures that that you know incentivize a lot of other banks to want to do it. Um, I think it's the problem in the current environment is that they won't even let a full reserve bank exist as an option. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas I think I think the you know I think it's reasonable for people to have that choice, but that's just the current incentive structure that they have in place. They don't, I can see why from the central banking perspective they don't particularly want that, even though obviously from a user perspective there are people that want it. Um, a lot of people just say why can't someone you know if they have more than a quarter million of deposits why can't they just spread that around. And one way to think about it is, is businesses. Um, businesses have a lot of incoming and outgoing cash flows. Uh, they generally need to hold larger amounts at a given time. And if they have multiple bank accounts, that's more overhead to manage. Um, there's also things they can do like sweep extra funds into money markets. Sometimes there's limits on how many times they can do that. Um, so they can still get caught with um, you know, some of their deposits uh, uninsured. Um, there's also fintech layers so that they can like say, from their perspective, it looks like they're running on one bank, but behind the scenes, they're using like you know 10 different bank accounts. And so they're their overall FDI insurance is limit. And a lot of those things are basically to go around the fact that, you know, a full reserve bank doesn't currently exist in the system. As far as Bitcoin is concerned, I think um, when you look at that, it helps look globally, right? Mm -hmm. So in the United States, you know, we're, we're talking about bank failures in the United States, but I mean, there's few places in the world where you'd want to hold money in a bank more than the United States. I mean, you know, maybe Switzerland, a few others, but especially the long tail of, um, you know, developing countries, uh, which is where the majority of people live, uh, their banking systems are notoriously unreliable. Uh, I think I think it was Safety and almost that calculated that the average 
uh, currency growth rate of a country was 29% per year compounded. And that's obviously, a, some of them are much higher than that. Most of them are less than that. The average developed market currency grows at broad my supply of like high single digits. Um, and so a lot of people face just one is ongoing currency problems. And then two, if they try to hold something like dollars in their bank account, they're, they're liable to have those be confiscated. That happens quite often. Um, you know, I know people in Egypt that are literally just holding cash dollars, uh, physical, um, for lack of knowing what else to do with it in, in Egypt, right? They don't really want to want to hold the Egyptian pound. It just got cut in half. Um, they don't particularly want to put those dollars in banks. Mm. Uh, you know, sometimes they hold gold and things like that. Um, and then they hold cash dollars. So they're getting all the inflation of the dollar without the interest rates in any way to kind of offset that. Um, and so I think it's natural that in a lot of these countries, you've seen interest in either stable coins, which is a, a way to access dollars outside. You know, they have counterparty risks, but they're, the, those counterparties are outside of their host country. So if you're a Nigerian and you want to hold dollars, uh, stable coins have been an option. Uh, and then Bitcoin is one that there's no counterparty risk, but then instead you have to take on the volatility risk um, mm -hmm. and that the overall risk of the network either, you know, will keep growing as it has been or will stop growing as it has been. Uh, and so I, I, I do think that Bitcoin is an interesting solution in the, in the long term. And but people obviously have to manage their exposure to it because, you know, you whilst nobody can, you know, if you hold the private keys, nobody can take your Bitcoin, but your Bitcoin can fluctuate dramatically in terms of purchasing power in a given time period. What, what do you think about that, Arnold? Uh, uh, I know you've been a crypto skeptic. You've described uh, cryptocurrencies as largely a pyramid scheme. But, Bitcoin, you know, some Bitcoin as it, viewing it as a hedge against real instability in the banking sector. Does that make sense to you? That, that doesn't excite me. I think the use cases are more like what Lynn said for people who don't have a uh, reliable government and banking system. Mm -hmm. uh, the, Do we I think, have that? Well, put it this way. If our banking system collapses, I, I think I think the best hedge against that is to have a vegetable garden. Okay. Because if the banking system collapses, you know, are we going to have an electric grid? Are we going to have the internet? Uh, and without those, are we going to have any Bitcoin? So, um, yeah. Uh, so I, I can't see that one. The, the you know um, speaking of crypto, there is a a lot of crypto enthusiasts believe that uh, what is happening with some of these banks is constitutes part of an ongoing war against crypto. We we had uh, Nick Carter on a few weeks ago who put out this idea of Operation Choke Point 2.0, which this time is focused on basically clamping down on cryptocurrency. Uh, this is all, of course, in the context of post FTX collapse. Um, you know, you mentioned Lynn earlier, Barney uh, Barney Frank's uh, bank signature, or you know, he's on the board at Signature, um, and he has claimed that the reason that Signature Bank was seized by a New York state agency. Uh, is not because it was insolvent. He said it was not insolvent, but that what part of what was happened was that regulators wanted to send a very strong anti-crypto message. Um, do you think that the government is currently sending that message? And if so, why? I think there's merit in the observation that some of the um, crypto participants have that, that some of these banks were uh, treated uh, differently. So basically the uh, signature... Bank, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, and Silver Gates are, um, you know, well, the, two of them uh, had a big crypto business. Silicon Valley Bank less so, but it it, it was still somewhat crypto friendly, um, and those were, you know, among the three that that failed. Um, Signature Bank's the one that's under scrutiny in the way because they weren't necessarily insolvent; they were illiquid because they had a similar problem where most of their depositors were businesses and therefore uninsured and therefore, you know, had a flight risk. Um, the, the interesting thing is that both Silvergate and, um, Signature Bank operated, uh, these kind of real time, uh, transaction, uh, services. So if, if, if a company deals with crypto trading, the problem is that crypto trades 24 seven and banks don't, uh, 
Um, and so what those banks would do is like you could you could send money 24 seven to like other um, users of that bank. And therefore, money dollars can move around, or at least you know, claims on dollars can move around as quickly as as crypto could. And so that was an important part of the liquidity for for the trading ecosystem. And what we've kind of seen in the past, say, forty eight hours or so, is that on the on the negotiations around purchasing Signature Bank's assets, um, one of the conditions, of, and this is reported by Reuters, is that they can't buy the crypto assets. That basically that that service that they're operating is something that the federal government does not particularly seem interested in allowing to continue to exist. Um, this is also where, I, so I, I do think there's merit in the choke point thesis and mm -hmm. that it's worth people pursuing, getting transparency on, um, you know, uh, seeing if there's kind of unfair crackdowns on an industry by industry basis. Um, but I think it's also worth pointing out that in this case, Bitcoin companies and crypto companies are kind of it's almost like a venn diagram that overlaps a little bit in the middle but they're they're actually quite different mm -hmm. in the sense that most of the crypto ones are very vc funded uh they're essentially unregistered securities in a way uh they have rather centralized teams and a lot of it is very active in that trading environment which is inherently kind of speculative whereas in the bitcoin space um they're less so reliant on those those um you know kind of trading uh rails that, that say silvergate and signature uh, ran, um, and they have less concentration of their, you know, what, 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 whatever companies do exist in the Bitcoin space, less of their funding is kind of concentrated in those hubs. Um, and so it's less kind of a, a direct attack on Bitcoin, but I do think it's a, a somewhat of a crackdown on some of the, the crypto VC space. And then as far as, as kind of Bitcoin as alternative asset goes, I mean, let's say you did have a big problem in a country and everybody needs veg vegetable gardens. One of the kind of the useful aspects of Bitcoin is that if someone has their private keys, they can leave uh, mm -hmm. that region and go to another region, and then be able to access their Bitcoin in that other region in a way that you know you can't bring cash to an airport, you can't bring gold to an airport. And so, for example, I know uh, I know someone from Venezuela that left the country with his Bitcoins, and he would not have been able to do that with with gold, for example, because you can bring your Bitcoins by remembering twelve words um, as your as your seed phrase. And, you know, you can reconstruct your ability to access Bitcoin when you get away. So, you know, I think that's when you when you kind of look at that global scale, uh, I think is when you can see why Bitcoin's interesting. Whereas in the context of developed countries, we mostly treat it like a portfolio asset. You might have, say, a Bitcoin slice next to your stock slice next to your T-bills. You know, people treat it as like a slice and diversified portfolio. Whereas people in some of these other types of countries treat it as more of like an actual utility asset that they mm -hmm. find useful in in certain contexts where say gold or even physical cash dollars would, would not be. Let, let me ask you about that, uh, Arnold, as our kind of uh, resident crypto skeptic here, you know, do, do you view these as fundamentally different? Like, you know, Bitcoin uh, is different from Ethereum, is different from NFTs, is different from whatever token FTX came up with. Um, there, there's clearly a lot of suspicion now um, in the government of kind of crypto as a broad asset category. Um, but, uh, you know, is there in a sense, are things just being painted with too broad a brush at this point? Or, or is it warranted that the government is really taking a much harder look at the, at the entire space right now? Um that that's like a probably a 20 minute question to which i'm probably not even qualified to answer um uh, let me see if i can take a pick a slice of the question to answer um uh, i guess the, you know a, an interesting question is how will crypto assets intersect with the what i'd call the formal banking system mm -hmm. you know the, the the system that government s supervises and cares about um and that's a question that people in government i'm sure are asking uh and uh i don't know what the right answer is i mean the the venezuelan taking bitcoin across the border uh is not really interested in being involved certainly in the venezuelan government banking system uh they're interested in escaping it 
Uh, and if your motive is to escape government, well, government's not that motivated to help you. Uh, and it may be motivated to harm you. And I guess you shouldn't be surprised at that. I guess the, the other aspect I'll take is, uh, so there's sort of a dilemma for the crypto people. Do you want to be friends with the government or enemies? Mm -hmm. And if you want to be friends, how friendly? So the, the other dilemma is centralized versus decentralized. So the promise of Bitcoin certainly is decentralized. Uh, maybe it's true with some of these others, but the more decentralized it is, it seems like the harder it is to use and the more profit opportunities there seem to emerge in coming up with centralized solutions. And these centralized solutions tend to bring in a lot of the fragility and uh, potential problems that you're trying to get away with with the decentralized system. So resolving that issue, I think, is tough. And I, I don't claim to have an answer. Fair enough. Le as we wrap up here, let me bring in one of our audience questions. And then I want to zoom out and look at the economy as a whole, at interest rates, at um, uh, inflation, and how these things are all interacting and get both of you to talk a little bit about where you expect things, you know, might be headed from here. Um, is is it all doom and gloom, or is there, you know, hope of the soft landing that uh, w we've been told about uh, several times? Um, but let me bring up this question first from Benjamin Dover, who says, "Is there a systemic risk of deposit insurance being substantially weakened by covering SVP deposits?" Um, Either of you have an opinion on that? My first thought is no. That I mean, as Lynn pointed out, they weren't SVB wasn't that far underwater to begin with, and you know there's a lot of money in the insurance fund. So that's I don't know if Lynn agrees or not, but. I, I agree. I think I would separate the theoretical from the practical. So theoretically, FDIC insurance only covers less than 1% of total deposits and a little bit over 1% of insured deposits. And so in theory, it's always this kind of thin layer of protection. Uh, but in practice, uh, since 1933, there's never been a insured deposit that they, did, that they didn't cover. Um, and one of the I think one of the few bipartisan things would be essentially backstopping FDIC. Um, that seems unlikely to be the thing they let go. So I, I think in practice, um, I don't really have, I, I would assign a very, very low probability that FDIC insured deposits would, would fail. So uh, to, to wrap up here, I want to bring up this, this uh, chart uh, from the board of governors and the treasury and uh, all of our slides, by the way, are linked uh, below if anyone wants to see the, the data we're using here. But um, it's got several lines here, and you can see a sort of unprecedented, at least in this snapshot here, situation where the blue line, the federal debt to GDP ratio is you know higher higher than ever. Um, the that's you know new new territory here. At the same time, the Fed is trying to tame inflation, which is the green line. You see it spiking up down there and uh, using uh, higher interest rates, which is the red line. Um, also, you know, obviously on an upward trajectory. So given this, what looks to me like a rather unprecedented situation, where do both of you expect this is all headed? I'll start with Arnold and then let Lynn uh, weigh in. Uh, I wish I knew. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll play the old man again um, and take you back to an incident in 1970 that is covered in a book called Super Money uh, that was, I think, came out in 72. Um, Penn Central Railroad went bankrupt in June of 1970. And exactly this type of scenario played out that the Fed was in the middle of trying to stop inflation. And they looked at the situation over the weekend and they said, 
if we don't do anything, it'll be the apple cart scenario. You know, it'll, it'll be another Great Depression. We can't, we have to do something. So they, in, in, in the telling of the story in this book, you know, they just got on the phone and called every bank and said, just make whatever loans you need. You know, we're not, you know, we're not trying to constrain credit anymore. Um, what followed were things like the new economic policy of Richard Nixon, which devalued the dollar and he tried wage and price controls and inflation kept getting higher and higher. You know, the, the seventies were not a good story. Are we headed to the same thing? Are we, you know, there's a lot of talk about abandoning any effort to fight inflation. I think, and I think John Cochran would think that any effort to fight inflation has to include a serious effort at reigning in the deficit and not just any one year, but all the out years. And that includes social security and Medicare. Are we going to see that? Probably not. So does that mean we're going to relive the 1970s with a lot of floundering and you know, random policy changes that don't do anything and you get a lot more inflation? So uh, anyway, it's, it's not an easy thing to answer. I just say that the one precedent that comes to my mind says, watch out for you know, lots more inflation and, and more troubles. And just to be very clear about that, wh why is it that bringing the deficit and eventually the debt under control is the essential component there from your viewpoint? Because ultimately that's what, you know, how the government injects money or wealth into the economy is by just running these deficits. And if you don't, and, and you know, how do you how do you get rid of government debt? You can def formally default. You just say, wake up tomorrow and say, sorry, bondholders, you're not getting anything. No. Or you can actually cut spending, raise taxes, or you can inflate it away. There's no sentiment to formally default. There's no sentiment to bring the deficit under control. So what you're left with, it seems to me, is inflation. And Lynn, what's have a nice your... day. As <laughs> Bye. No, uh, Lynn, let, let's. Uh, I'm sure you're going to cheer us up here. I think, unfortunately, not. I think I have to agree with the inflation thesis. Um, one, I guess, a bit of color I'll add is that the 1970s, when you look at that um, inflation dynamic, even though there was a deficit problem, a lot of it was from ex uh, very high levels of bank lending. That was our fastest pace of bank lending in, in U.S. history. And that, that really coincided with, with uh, you know, people that were born and, you know, the baby boomer generation entering their home buying years. And so you had that surge of demand at the same time as you had, obviously, the oil uh, supply constraints. And so a lot of the there was more money creation from bank lending than there was from fiscal deficits. Whereas if you look back further to 1940s, uh, that was a, an equally as inflationary decade. Um, and there's very little bank lending and it was almost entirely a fiscal driven phenomenon. The, the basically massive deficits to fight the war were, were highly inflationary. Um, and the current environment we find ourselves in in the 2020s in many ways is more similar to 1940s, which is the vast majority of the money creation and the inflation was not because of excessive bank lending. I mean, bank lending levels are pretty normal, and almost all of it was from unusually large fiscal deficit that we've not seen since World War II as a percentage of GDP. Hmm. And I also, I don't, I don't really see a realistic path to cutting that anytime soon because you have Social Security, Medicare, is, it, that's very popular programs. Um, uh, it's it just, it's, it's you know, kind of that third rail that that politicians don't want to touch. Um, we have military spending, you know, we have 750 foreign military bases, over 800 billion a year on that. But especially what's going on geopolitically, it's, it's you know, that, that's not likely to be cut anytime soon. Um, and also then you have a lot of politicians that some of them do want to raise taxes, other ones don't. Uh, it seems like there's a, enough of a mix that it's, it's taxes are unlikely to go up materially. And so I think that, you know, we look at the 1970s, they because debt to GDP was so low, one of the things that they were able to do was sharply raise rates to try to bring down bank lending, get the positive real rates, 
um, and that helped get inflation under control. Whereas 1940s, because you had over 100% debt to GDP, um, it was very hard to raise rates. And so instead, they just kept rates low despite high inflation. And anyone holding dollars, bonds, uh, and things like that really got devalued on an ongoing basis. And so I think that unfortunately, the 2020s are kind of shaping up in that direction where, you know, they might get the positive real yields for brief periods of time, uh, especially if they, you know, they're willing to cause a recession to do it. Um, but I think the majority of the decade probably is just going to be have a tough time getting inflation under control because I don't think they're going to get the deficits under control. Um, and I also don't think that interest rates are going to be high enough to compensate people for it. Have so, a nice uh, day. Yes, our closing <laughs> message is hold on to your hats, folks. Uh, I wanted, but I, I do want to thank uh, Lynn Alden and uh, Arnold Kling for joining me to talk through all this today. It's been really informative, and I recommend subscribing to uh, Lynn's newsletter, subscribe to Arnold's uh, Substack, and of course, subscribe to Reason TV. We'll be back here next week uh, with another conversation. Uh, we're going to be talking with Ethan Nadelman about the case for legalizing all drugs. Maybe that will help, uh, you know, numb some of the pain going into this. But uh, th thank you, Arnold. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you to Adam Sullivan, our producer. And thank you to our audience for tuning in. We'll see you next week.